Welcome to Truth Telling with Elizabeth Dialto, the podcast dedicated to focusing on the truth that's always evolving within us and around us, where we explore the potentiality of truth as a highly esteemed value, especially in the context of everything that falls under the topics of healing, growth, leadership, and creativity. If you're new to me, full expression is my jam. I'm the creator of a practice called Wild Soul Movement, My flagship year-long online women's circle is called Power. I run virtual new moon circles every month, weekend workshops all over the planet throughout the year, and I work with clients one-on-one. I also started doing stand-up comedy for fun in 2018. So this is a place where you can come with your multiple talents and passions to be encouraged, nourished, and cultivated. There's a lot of noise and ignorance in our current culture, and the show also aims to cut through that by exploring the truths of a diverse range of incredible voices. From authors, artists, creatives, and educators, to activists, speakers, and those in various scientific and esoteric fields, our guests hail from cultures and countries all over the world. The main intention here is to contribute to creating a kinder, gentler, more curious, collaborative, reverent world where people respect each other's backgrounds, experiences, and truths, and they trust in themselves and in life and recognize that we need each other. We post a new interview every Monday, and if you want to keep up with the show notes and quotes from our guests, you can follow me on Instagram at Elizabeth Tialto. A few disclaimers. No episode of the show is meant for everyone, and every episode is meant for whoever needs it on the right day at the right time. Not all guest views will reflect my own, and that's intentional. We don't learn, grow, heal, or improve by staying in our comfortable bubbles with all of our people who look, think, or live exactly how we do. If you love what you hear and find it useful and inspiring, the best way to show your appreciation is to share the episode, subscribe to the show, and leave us a rating or review wherever you listen in from. Thank you so much for being here, and here we go. What's up, everybody? This is episode number 328 of Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto, and this is our third episode in this year's Journey into the Wild Soul. So as we start this episode, this episode is about embodiment, and I want to tell you something here, um, and that is that I really had to reel myself in for this episode, and I actually love that. And What I mean by reel myself in is... This could have been a three-hour episode, maybe even more than that, but I'm not doing that to you, you know, during the holiday season or at all for that matter. Um, That's more of like a masterclass than a podcast episode. Um, But I love that because embodiment is so vast and so deep and touches on and impacts so many things in our lives when we get all up in it. So I just want to tell you that to start that I've 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 narrowed down <laughs> so much of what I could have shared with you and one of the reasons it was easy to do that is because n- this week actually at the time this episode goes live it's December 9th. This week I'm running the annual Wild Soul Movement Embodiment Challenge which is 5 days that I share practices with you. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but um, I also know that I'm going to be breaking down and spending time with anyone who joins that challenge this week and being able to get much deeper into individual concepts and practices and answering questions and things like that. So it's one of the reasons why I was able to narrow down what I wanted to put into this episode. And as well, um, I also did a whole episode last year called What is Embodiment and Why Is It Everything? And I looked back at that episode to make sure that this one wasn't going to be super redundant, and it's not. And even that in and of itself speaks to how vast and dynamic embodiment work is, that I could do a whole like hour show last year on embodiment and then do a whole nother one this year. And really, there, of course, will be some overlap, but and I could just take it in a completely different direction and touch on some different things. So I do also recommend that you go back and listen to last year's episode. We'll link up to that in the show notes, which will be at untameyourself.com forward slash 328 to just add more layers to your understanding if you want to. 
So just a reminder, if you are tuning into this series, The Journey into the Wild Soul, um, I do this every year around this time to wrap up the year with focus and intention. So what we do is take a look at your inner world to make sure you can have the best possible outer world experience. And this year, our theme is wholeness. So I want to remind you that the intention here is to reflect on the year and perhaps previous years in your life, which since it's 2019 and we're embarking on a whole new decade starting in 2020, That reflection feels to me anyway, much deeper this year and also wider, right? I'm looking back on who have I been over the last decade, all like the big, big lessons, not just the last year. And so if you want to join me in that, that that is welcome, although not required. And it's also to invite you to consider if how you've been going about your growth, healing, and transformation is really effective, or if it's more performative, obligatory, inefficient, ineffective, or even just a distraction. Um, and in some extreme cases, it can be an addiction. So this is about real deal empowerment. And to be clear, that means um, helping you to empower yourself, right? I'm not out here trying to empower you because I can't do that for you, but I am here to give you tools, ideas, different approaches, looking at things from different angles to help you connect to the love and truth inside of you. And ultimately, those two things are your power. Those are the anchors of your power. That's what your power is rooted in. So to everyone who has joined the private Facebook group, um, I love your shares. Each week, I you know post some insights from the episodes and see what's landing for people. I've been loving seeing people's shares. Um, and a lot of people have mentioned that um, these episodes help them to discover so much about themselves and do things differently in their lives or just shift, see things differently, which then gives them so much more peace and openness and acceptance for themselves so that they can go about things differently with different energy. And I love that. So um, if you want to join that Facebook group, if you want to be part of the community and the conversation, it's free. Go over to wildsoulmovement.com forward slash journey 2020, and you can get up in there. And um, this is our third episode. You don't have to go back and listen to the other episodes first uh, before diving into this one. Um, and Because again, embodiment kind of anchors in everything. But if you feel compelled, those are episodes number 326 and 327. And so- Here's what I want to start with today um, in terms of how we're going to explore embodiment in this episode. I do want to start by pulling something back from last year, which is something I said to start that episode, and that is that the larger implication of embodiment is revolution. And I said this because we live in a culture that benefits greatly from people staying disconnected from their deepest inner truths love, and power. And those things live and thrive through our bodies, feelings, senses, and emotions. So when we numb or deny ourselves or when we disembody, culture wins. And I put that in air quotes, meaning culture wins, um, because that that can mean a lot of different things on a lot of different levels. But essentially what I'm saying is all this programming, all this conditioning that we all get growing up in this culture um, that's rooted in systems and structures and methodologies and thought processes and worldviews like patriarchy, misogyny, white supremacy, racism, all of these things get to carry on unimpeded if we are not getting into our bodies, if we're not feeling into our yeses, our noes, our truths, if we're not unpacking our unconscious biases, which obviously a lot of those are ingrained in the mind, but it's the body Um, noticing how things feel to us and resonate for us or are dissonant for us that help us to really identify what needs to be unpacked. So when we do this work to go in, connect, and listen, and build our lives, values, families, businesses, and communities around what's inside, culture can't win because deep inside we know what is bullshit nonsense, unfair, unjust, and straight up ridiculous, unnecessary, and unacceptable. So the larger implication of embodiment is revolution. And that's both collectively and personally, because the two intertwine. 
And listen, I am not ever out here over idealizing or pretending that there isn't a lot of work to be done to truly uproot and change all the things that need changing in our culture. But I am always out here saying we've got more power to affect things than we think we do. So let me say that again to you directly. You have got more power to affect things than you think you do. And embodiment work helps you to discover how actually true that is. So the question of the day is, what is your personal embodiment revolution about? Because that's the place where we can all begin. So as we go through this episode and I touch on the points that I'm going to touch on, I want you to keep that question in the back of your mind. And if you are joining us for the journey into the wild soul and coming into the pop-up Facebook group, share that with me in there. If you don't feel like getting into a Facebook group, no worries. But email us, hello at wildstillmovement.com or find me on Instagram. And I'm literally inviting you to slide into my DMs. I want to know what is your personal embodiment revolution about right now, right? Because it'll change over time, but just right now, what is most present for you? And let's have that conversation. So also let me give you a little bit more information about the embodiment challenge. Here's the deal. Every woman deserves to feel safe and at home in her body. And what I offer you in the embodiment challenge is specifically designed to show you how to do that. So for the five days, December 9th through the 13th, I'm offering short guided practices to help you embody your power and wholeness and connect you to your inner wisdom. So the first day is going to be just a simple breathing exercise to activate your senses. The second day is a head to toe practice to ground yourself and also balance your energy. The third day is a mind-body practice to calm your nervous system and reduce stress and anxiety. And this is a great practice because you could use it anytime, anywhere. The fourth day is a guided sensual movement practice for self-discovery and healing. And then the fifth day is a whole wild soul movement practice for a potent and integrative mind, body, soul experience. And so words can't really do that justice. You'll have to try that out to really see what I mean by that. So that's what we're doing in the embodiment challenge. And then that weekend, the 14th or the 15th, I haven't set the time yet at the time I'm recording this, but I will in the next 48 hours, we're going to have an embody party. So that's going to be a live streamed thing. I will come to you live from my living room to yours to move together because doing these practices on our own is beautiful and effective and important, but then also doing them together makes it... um, just gives it a big energetic boost, some camaraderie, some connection, some sisterhood. It just creates a bigger, bigger effect, bigger impact in your life, even if it's digital. So that's what we're doing for the embodiment challenge. And you can sign up for that at wildsoulmovement.com forward slash embodiment dash challenge. And again, if you're the type of person who just likes to follow along on these things in your own way, that's totally cool. Um, But if you're someone who the community aspect of it feels like a breath of fresh air or like this relief and this nourishment that you are starving for, please join us. We'd love to have you. So this year, in the embodiment challenge, as well as in my year-long women's circle power, I'm putting extra focus on the heart and the nervous system. And the reason why is, you know, I've been teaching this work for six years now, and I'm always going deeper and deeper into my own work. So rest assured, anything that I'm teaching or sharing with you, I've done, this will be an exaggeration. I'm going to say a million times over, not a million, but certainly thousands of times over in my own experience. And likely my own practice is going um, deeper, wider, and I'm always exploring and experimenting with things to embody my own self before I bring them to you and share them with you. And so in my own practice over the last couple of years and this year, more deeply than ever, I've made some big connections between the soul's wisdom coming through the heart specifically, not just the body in general, and also how vital embodiment is to nervous system healing. And actually just this week, the episode won't come out until January, but I was introducing an acquaintance and colleague of mine, Irene Lyon, who does specialize in helping people heal from trauma um, through practices that address the nervous system um, in a somatic way. And last week we talked about, you know, somatics and what that means and how that is essentially embodiment work. And um, 
it was cool to see even deeper the parallels between what we do in Wild Soul Movement and the embodiment practices I teach and how these things also show up in somatic work to heal the nervous system. So um, what's cool about this is none of this is telling you to ignore your mind or leave your mind behind. When we have embodiment practice, when we are connecting in with our heart specifically, and then connecting in with our body with awareness of our nervous systems, we can then harness the power of the mind very productively. We can see facts more clearly. We can analyze things effectively without overanalyzing ourselves. Um, And because we're getting a fuller picture by considering the heart and the body's wisdom, we really can create very beautiful connection and relationship between mind, body, heart, and soul. And this is one of the things that actually makes embodiment work extremely efficient. And I understand up front, you know, again, because so many of us are raised that like the mind is king or queen and that, you know, we should just rely on the mind and logic and, you know, rational and even critical thinking, which I'm a big proponent of critical thinking. Um, But when we're not embodied, when we're not connected into our body, to our hearts, to the wisdom of our soul coming through our body, and we are only relying on the mind, that's when we get ourselves into pickles and conundrums and situations and messes that we then have to clean up later. So embodiment practice is super efficient in the long term because we are making better, more aligned, accurate decisions up front by doing the embodiment work rather than down the road later on, realizing that was not the right choice. That did not serve. In some cases, I've gotten myself into a situation that now I have to figure out how to get myself out of and then heal from, right? We traumatize ourselves or we make ourselves sick, right? By signing up for things, anything. It could be a job. It could be a relationship. It could be all kinds of stuff, obligations that we perceive are obligations, but actually aren't when we're not in our bodies, So when you're in your body and when you're connecting into all this wisdom and information available to you, again, it's just efficient. It's almost like reversing the order of operations. We do the work up front to make better choices so that those choices just continue to fuel us and then we could just continue making better choices, again, without having so often to clean up messes along the way um, or to get in these like emotional pickles of judging ourselves or beating ourselves up or like regret and shame and these things, guilt that we can really spiral into and then have to spend so much time getting out of. So I hope that point makes sense to you. So in last week's episode, I mentioned that I would go deeper into the difference between judgment and discernment and how judgment happens in the mind and discernment happens in the body. So let's get into that now because the mind spins things into stories via overanalysis, right? The body just gives you information and you get better at receiving this information by learning to speak what I call your embodied language, which is your body's unique language of the senses. So this comes from last year's episode, but it really does bear repeating because what's so important of about this aspect of embodiment is that when you're connected to your body, you're much less likely to bypass or bullshit yourself. So it's not a perfect system. Nothing is. And our ability to bypass and bullshit ourselves is sophisticated, right? (laughs) Like we could talk ourselves into or out of anything, but our ability to understand our body's unique language of the senses is also sophisticated and in a way serves as the antidote to the inclination to bypass. And so this is why it's important to get out of your head and into your body so that, again, you just make better choices up front and these are choices that are aligned with your truth and with your power rather than many of the things the ego is attached to as a result, again, of you know how we're all raised and you know what's in our orientation and why why we would pursue things that our ego wants us to do rather than connecting in with what's really right and true and deep and soulful to us. So a question that I often ask people is to get to begin to get them oriented to speak in their body's unique language of the senses is what do you feel and where do you feel it? And I really try to get people to, to be very descriptive. 
Is there a texture, a density, light, or heavy? Is there a color? How would you describe the sensations? I get them to really go into it because there's always tremendous value in being able to describe the sensations without attaching emotion to it. So again, you can learn to discern between the two when faced with either or both, which brings me to a point that I briefly have touched on already, and that's having a yes-no truth practice, which again is the anchor, the, the real root of the difference between judgment and discernment. When we're judging, we're just in our heads. We're disconnected from the wisdom of the body. Discernment brings in the body's wisdom. It allows us to feel for what's real and what's true, as opposed to only just thinking about it or analyzing it, or making pros and cons lists, or trying to be rational about something, because the rational choice is not always the best choice if it's not informed by the body's wisdom. So discernment brings in the body's wisdom, helping us to feel for what's real and what's true. And again, it's an invaluable skill to develop. And, you know, something that I want to point out is this is something else I've really come to more deeply this year, and I want to put extra emphasis on. When we talk about discovering and feeling for what's a yes, what's a no, and what's truth in your system, you know, this is also something I've been teaching for six years. So many of you listening have been doing this practice with me and will appreciate this extra aspect. And if it's new to you, this is just a great place to start with your understanding. Your no is more important than your yes. So being able to feel for a no in your body or in your heart is more important than being able to feel for a yes because your no informs your yes. And let me give you a good analogy for this outside of ourselves to also help you understand how it operates internally. If you have anyone in your life who is great with boundaries and great at saying no, when they do say no to you, what you also then know is that when they say yes, you can really trust it. Because listen, a lot of people, and you know, all of us included, I'm sure you can think of dozens if not hundreds of times in your life when you have said yes, when you really wanted to say no, but there were all kinds of reasons why you didn't say no. You didn't want to hurt someone's feelings. You didn't want them to feel bad. You didn't want them to judge you or think a specific thing. You were afraid that you'd be rejected or you wouldn't be loved if you said no. Like, There's all kinds of reasons why we do this, right? But you know, if there's someone in your life and they say no, that when they say yes, they really mean it. So it's the same for us. If you can really connect to your no, when something is a yes, you know it's really a yes. It's not a reluctant yes. It's not a half yes that ends up in regret later or resentment. So your no is more important than your yes. And here's something else. Again, because our yeses can be so skewed and so rooted in people-pleasing, needing to be loved and liked, fears of rejection. So again, attuning to your no first helps you to be okay with not being okay with things, right? To actually being a no. And this will vary across, you know, different contexts and different categories in your life. But what also happens is sometimes when you ask someone, you know, what are you passionate about or what do you value? They might not be able to articulate it. And sometimes, or what are your desires or what are your dreams? And so a great place to start is what are you against? What pisses you off? What incenses you or upsets you? What makes you so angry you want to flip a table? You know, that's always my analogy. Like, this shit makes me want to flip a freaking table. What makes you feel that way? That's pretty easy to answer for most people. Well, then you can look at what's on the other side of that. So, for example, injustice and specific injustices. These are, these are part of the things, right? So if you look at the specific injustices that piss you off and make your blood boil and enrage you, What's on the other side of that? Liberation, equity, equality, inclusivity, right? All all these different things that, again, we could be much more specific. I'm just going in broad strokes here to give examples, right? And, And it helps you to see what you're most passionate about, what really matters to you, what are 
your values, right? My biggest values personally are love, freedom, generosity, kindness slash compassion, because I feel like those are really included in each other, um, and curiosity. So these things drive almost, I mean, everything I do in my life. And I was able to arrive at my values by looking at what really pisses me off and upsets me. What makes me want to like punch people in the face, you know? What like is devastating to see going on out in the world that I really want to contribute to helping to resolve. So listening to these things. And listen, sometimes it's our other things will influence your no, right? Like if you have trauma, that'll influence your no. And that's fine. Because if your trauma is saying no, um, that is still guiding you in a good direction. However, on the other side of that, and this is something that a recent podcast guest, Erin Telford, reminded us of, is that often when you do have trauma in your system, what your body is saying yes to might actually not be good for you, right? Something might be resonating to you because it's familiar or because it's an experience you've had, but that's not actually good for you or safe for you. And I can certainly relate to this, especially in the context of relationships. Like I know that I have certainly met men and been like, oh, they feel like my family before I had unpacked all of the dysfunction from my family. And so what I was resonating with was like a familiar, unhealthy situation and then just bringing in a repeating reality into my life, um, which eventually helped me to heal. But now I don't do that anymore. So by attuning to your no, you'll get to clearer yeses eventually. And as you go through this process, I also encourage you to treat a maybe like a no. Like it's okay to be a little more vigilant with your no when you're first attuning to these things. And then eventually, if, if something's a maybe, you could be like, all right, well, you know, you can feel for like the degree of no in the maybe. But when you're first practicing, treat maybes like no's. And then what's cool about this is it, I mean, there's a million cool things about it, but one of the things it eventually gets you to is never feeling that feeling of FOMO again. So if you're familiar with the term FOMO, it's the fear of missing out. And so this is one of the ways, um, one of the reasons why we'll say yes when we mean no, because we don't want to miss out on something. So when you get really good at being embodied and knowing when something's an actual no for you, you literally, you don't care about missing out on things. And then you eventually get yourself, uh, someone has made up this term JOMO, which is the joy of missing out. <laughs> and it's so true. Like some of you have already been doing this work for a while. And so you know how good it feels to say no to something <laughs> that you really didn't want to do, right? Even if like online you're seeing people post pictures and it looks like it was a great time, there's some real joy in being like, oh my God, it would have been miserable for me. I'm so glad I didn't go. I have two recent examples of this that I'll share with you from my own life. So maybe you can kind of see, like anchor into this. I went to this conference a couple of years ago called Summit and I made a, a handful of really amazing connections. And one of the people I connected with, this really interesting man who's, you know, worked in a couple different industries that are fascinating to me over his career and who's connected to all these really interesting people. He puts on a lot of events. Like he's just involved in some things that seem like they'd be so cool. There'd be great people to meet there, maybe even a potential man, maybe even someone I could date that we'd have like aligned values and interests and ambitions. And so I was excited to be connected to this person. And, you know, we used to work out of the same co-working space. So we'd connect here and there. And, you know, this person is one of those people who's just like a real, a real visionary and also like a slick talker. This person has a lot of big ideas and it's just like an excited about life, enthusiastic person. However, what I came to realize over time is not someone with a lot of follow through. So um, they like constantly spinning a lot of plates, has so many connections, but um, none of them actually go that deep. And there's so many things that get thrown out like, oh, we should do this or we should do this or we should do this that don't actually end up happening. 
So I noticed pretty quickly into our friendship uh, that I really couldn't put a lot of stock into anything this person said, right? I'd, I'd really have to wait and see, all right, what's going to what's gonna come through? What's going to come out of this? And then I'll make a choice rather than just going on this person's words or enthusiasm or excitement. And so a couple of weeks ago, this person invited me to something and I was like, oh, that'll be great. And I was planning to go. And on the day of, I just I wasn't feeling it. It was going to be all the way in downtown Los Angeles, which at the time of day probably would have taken me at least an hour to get there. And I just reminded myself, I reflected back on all the things that I have gone to with this person and all the people that I've met through this person. And you know how people say, there's this saying, birds of a feather flock together. No one I've ever connected with through this person has actually ended up being a really valuable connection in my life or any kind of deep connection. It was super surface level and super fleeting, kind of like my experience of this person. So I was like, oh, I am not going to stress myself out to go to a thing when I know the likelihood of it being anything fruitful is very slim based on past experiences. And so again, it was that tension in my body when I thought about going and when I thought about kind of like just pushing myself a little bit to get there. And my body was being like, no. I was like, I got to pay attention to that. No. So this also points back to why having embodiment practice is efficient. Because let me tell you, if I would have pushed myself to go to that and had, again, that similar kind of experience that I'm used to having with this person, the next two days probably would have been training for me to bounce back from it. So that's what I wanted to share about the discernment and the judgment, yeses, nos, and truths, and this newer distinction of uh, prioritizing the no in terms of having a practice and learning to speak your body's unique language of the senses. So another thing that I wanted to cover in this episode is at the time I'm recording this, it's just something I just posted recently on Instagram. It was a post about embodiment practice and what embodiment practice actually is. And so the, the image itself said, Embodiment work helps you to reject external objectification and sexualization so that you could develop your own perception and experience of your body. Now, embodiment practice is not exclusive to any gender, but this particular blurb about embodiment and objectification and sexualization is really geared towards women because this is something that women deal with in a much different capacity than men, right? And I'm sure as well, some transgender and gender fluid folks fall under that category. So rather than saying women, let me just say non-men, right? So to the outside world, embodiment work might look sexy or performative, but the real goals of embodiment work are to feel safe and at home in your body, I've, as I've already said, learn to speak the unique language of your senses. And then beyond that, trust yourself, and maybe even fall in love, right? And here's the deal. I'm not, people will put the label of body positive on my work, um, but I don't take on that label because that's a whole movement in and of itself. Um, And I'm not necessarily attached to people needing to feel positively about their bodies. Um, I, I do really dig the idea of body neutrality, which is not feeling one way or another. It's just a body, right? Like it just is what it is. Um, and But I do also then talk about body love, right? So this is where sometimes things kind of coincide or contradict or we can hold many things at once um, or body appreciation. Because even if I don't necessarily feel super positive about how my body looks, I can have so much appreciation for what my body does and the experiences that I'm only able to have because I am in a body, right? So so those types of terms, like apply them however you want to apply them, feel about them however you want to feel about them. But um, that's what I mean by maybe even fall in love. So of course, there are days when I'm like, huh. I wish that thing on my body was different. And I still love my freaking body at the same time because she's a freaking miracle machine and so is yours. So most women don't feel safe in their bodies for 
So many reasons. With rampant messaging everywhere that creates internalized body shame and feeling like your body could be an invitation for harm, it makes sense why you would close off from your body. And of course, maybe you've had violations that justify you wanting to close off because it feels like your body invites danger or harm. So when you close yourself off though, the problem with this or the limitation this creates is while you might feel safer, you're also more likely to keep people at arm's length or limit yourself from deeply connecting with people in all kinds of contexts, um, which ultimately means cutting yourself off from the right kind of nourishment that you need, want, desire, and yearn for um, because you feel unsafe or self-conscious. So what I want you to know is that these things don't have to be a trade-off. You can feel and be safe in your body and also have deep, deep connection with people. Like you don't have to close yourself off. So spending time with your body in a deep committed practice, and we talked about deep committed practice last week, establishes a baseline of safety, love, and care for your amazing vessel that is your body and allows you to treat your body as sacred rather than something to be objectified or sexualized because your body is wise. It's beautiful, unique, vast, and dynamic and deserves to be treated as sacred. So never forget that. And then also, it would be irresponsible of me not to mention that sometimes before you could deeply benefit from an embodiment practice, you have to heal some trauma. And they also complement each other, trauma healing and embodiment work, which is why you want to find embodiment practices that are trauma-informed, that understand um, that getting into your body might feel and be actually unsafe for people at first. So you have to gradually work it as a process which again, and I might sound like a broken record, I know that might feel inefficient um, to do the work, to heal the trauma and to get in your body. But honestly, if you are just bypassing it and pushing through, that eventually catches up to you by means of illness, which could be you know physical, it could be mental, it could be extreme anxiety. Again, I mentioned earlier, I interviewed my friend Irene um, and she mentioned, you know, sometimes people later in life start getting panic attacks or anxiety or depression in ways they never have before. And often that's just a sign of trauma that's just been pushed down, pushed down, pushed down and not dealt with. So having embodiment practices creates the landscape in your body to allow these things to surface so that they can be be healed and they can be treated with the love and the respect that they deserve so that they don't have to be things that, you know, hold you back or hold you down or plague you for your entire life. So I also, earlier this year, I want to go back to embodiment work. It might look sexy. Like I post these embodiment videos and a lot of them are, it's sensual movement and it's movement by following you know, the impulses and the sensations of my body. And because in our culture, women's bodies are so over sexualized and objectified, if you're looking at these videos through that lens, right, that a woman's body is something to be consumed or something that is for somebody else's pleasure, um, the videos might seem sexy or performative. I actually had a woman on a Facebook post earlier this year say, why is this porn popping up in my feed? And you know, it was funny because like, if it's popping up, it's because you follow my page. <laughs> so it was like, just unfollow me lady. Right. But also it's like, it's, she was calling it porn because of the way I was moving, I don't know, or because my hands were on my own body or because I was wearing like shorts, I, I don't know. But it's, and that's just an indicator and I have no judgment for her because that again, is just an indicator of the internalized programming so many of us have as how we literally see women's bodies. So this comes back to something I said a few minutes ago about like neutrality, right? A body is just a body. So if I'm able to view a body as just a body and I'm able to hear that, oh, I can move in my body to like be with my sensations and move things through my body and allow things to be released and actually soothe myself to have a better experience in my body. There's nothing objectifying or sexual about that, but it is sensual. 
I also made a post several weeks ago about the difference between sensuality and sexuality. And um, I spent a lot of my younger years, and many of you listening can probably relate to this, thinking sensuality with an S, right, meant sexuality with an X, just so you're hearing the difference in case it sounds the same, without realizing that, of course, the two can overlap in delicious ways, but sensuality is a powerful thing all on its own. Now I see sexuality and sensuality as two separate but complementary things, right? So sexuality is what you think it is. It's your thoughts, feelings, attractions, or actions towards other people or yourself. Sexuality comes down to desire. It's deeply personal and can include emotions, personality traits, physical characteristics, and much more. But ultimately, it has an end goal of sexual intimacy or sexual pleasure. Sensuality, however, is literally about being present with and paying attention to your senses. Sensuality is how we experience an array of pleasure and delight. It clues us in on our truth. It helps us with discernment, as I talked about earlier. It connects us to inner wisdom. And so for me, movement is one of the best ways to experience sensuality. Sensual movement can be any kind of movement that's done specifically to engage with and increase your perception of your senses. The focus isn't on form, but on feeling in the body. Sensual movement helps to relax the mind and integrate your intuition with your logic. And one thing that people struggle to get since a lot of culture and media over-sexualize, over-sexualizes the body, is that the main point of sensual movement is not to express any kind of sexuality or connect to that. The point is sensuality for the sake of consciously inhabiting your body and enjoying a fuller, more alive experience of it, right? So many people are numb to their body and their body's sensations. So to be really clear, Sensuality is also not all pleasure and delight, but it will be all valid, useful, and honest experience. Um, And so in this post, I had said, I'll say a lot more about this in the journey into the wild soul. So this is me saying a lot more about this in the journey into the wild soul right now. Um, It makes a really big difference to be able to engage with your senses in a way that allows you to feel for all these different things. And also, when I say not bullshit or bypass yourself, we are not into, we being, you know, wild souls, people in my community, anyone who is into my body of work here, everything is not about positivity about here, y'all, because negative things happen, crappy things happen. We don't feel good all the time. We're not supposed to, right? And so this, you know, people call this toxic positivity now, and that's just wanting everything to be positive all the time and really kind of like shunning um, or shaming things that are not positive. There's a lot of not positive stuff in the world. So when we are embodied and when we're engaged with our senses, we can build a resiliency to face the things that aren't positive. We can be honest, like, oh, this feels like shit. And so what am I going to do about it? So being engaged with your senses, having embodiment practices helps you to be honest and to navigate the very real things that need to be navigated in your life in order to be well, to be healthy, to be happy, to be safe, to be you know, connected to other people, to have great relationships, to be successful, to accomplish things. Because again, you're not just living in this delusion or illusion that everything should be positive or happy all the time. That is just not freaking real. Um, So what else? Let me see here. What else was the last thing that I wanted to share with you? Okay. So the last chunk of the episode here that I want to spend probably 10 or 15 minutes on is I want to walk you through some of the Wild Soul Movement Embodiment Bible. So there's so many things that I talk about in social media, in podcast episodes that come up with our guests over and over and over, year in and year out. I finally put together a Wild Soul Movement embodiment Bible with like the basics. This is a downloadable PDF, which again, if you sign up for the embodiment challenge, I'll send you the embodiment Bible. So um, if you were on the wait list for Power 2020 earlier this year, Um, you already have the embodiment Bible. I sent it to you. And so now the way to get the embodiment Bible is to join 
the embodiment challenge. I won't have any other way um, to be sending it to you of, until early 2020. So um, if you want to be able to download this thing, go on over to wildsoulmovement.com forward slash embodiment dash challenge, and you will get the Wild Soul Movement Embodiment Bible in your welcome email there. So I put together this embodiment Bible, and there's concepts and practices in here. I'm going to get into some of the concepts with you since during the actual challenge this week, we'll get into the practices. And in fact, we'll get into more practices more deeply than are in the Bible. But I want to, I want to address some of the concepts with you so you can start percolating on them. And so to open up the Bible, I always, um, whenever I open up anything like this, I always write a little love note. And so the welcome note here says, it's time to live a more sensual embodied life, to develop more trust and love for your body, to connect to the power, joy, truth, wisdom, and purpose that has always been inside of you. And the reasons why these things matter and the benefits of pursuing them are endless. So I shared a Rumi poem because I love Rumi. Tell me the truth, I ask love. What are you? I am the everlasting life, love said. I am the recurring joy of living. And so I wrote the Embodiment Bible at the end of October 2019, and I was reflecting on the immense amount of challenges, complexity, and volatility in the world. And it's clear that um, our nervous systems are being overloaded, right? But the earth hasn't given out on us yet. So that must mean we are meant to be here, working it out and getting through it. So how then do we thrive? How do we feel free, find joy, and not get mired in hustling, struggling, or just getting by? I believe in paradox and that we can hold many things at once. So even amidst frustration, stress, feeling overwhelmed, fears, doubts, or not being where we want to be, which is how a lot of people feel, how can we also maintain passion, hunger, enthusiasm, and excitement for living? You cannot find the answers to those questions in your mind or in a text. The answers to life's deepest questions always have and always will live in your body, right? And again, as I said earlier, more specifically, in some cases, in your heart. Your body is a genius. It's your reason for being here on earth. It's what connects you directly to your soul and to the divine, if you're someone who cares to connect to the divine. It's the only home you're guaranteed. And it's a living, breathing, hyper-creative source of wonder, awe, and miracles. It's a work of art. It's a healing machine. It's a trusty guide. It's imperfect and unique. It's a whole experience and one a lot of women take for granted, treat as a burden, or sadly even hate. And that's why you're here, right? You wouldn't even be listening to this episode. You wouldn't be checking out things like my challenge or like the Embodiment Bible if you didn't care to have a different or a better experience. So the relationship you're meant to have with your body is based in love, trust, and acceptance. Your body gives you the experience of the recurring joy of living, like the opening poem from Rumi said. So if you're not experiencing those things right now, there's no need to judge or blame yourself. It's likely no one ever taught you how. And believe me, if you're a woman living in the 21st centuries, chances are you need someone to teach you. So hello, this is what I'm here for. After working with thousands of women in and around their bodies since 2008 in a few different professional contexts, I firmly believe that embodiment is the absolute most critical key to healing and sustainable well-being. So let me say that again. I firmly believe that embodiment is the absolute most critical key to healing and sustainable well-being. You don't learn this growing up because you're too busy learning to pick your body apart in an effort to get it to be pleasing, desirable, or perform likely for someone else's benefit or approval. It's just how most women are cultured, which we talked about earlier. This orientation is practically in the air that you breathe. So the specifics of the beliefs and the inner dialogue about body may vary, but the result is the same. Living disconnected from your body, which also means disconnected from your soul. So this looks like having no idea how magical and wise you really are and lacking tools, practices, and skills to tap into your innate magic and wisdom. And since nothing exists in isolation, these beliefs about the body trickle into other areas of life too. Lacking connection to your body can also translate into lacking intimacy, closeness, and support in your relationships, fulfillment in your role as a parent or in your career, health, vitality, vibrancy, passion, joy, meaning, purpose, or fun in your life as a whole. 
So there are six aspects of embodiment that I explore in the Bible for our broader concepts to our core practices from Wild Soul Movement. And in this episode today, I'm I'm really going to focus in on two of the concepts, which are observing and feeling. And that's how we'll wrap up today. So, and don't worry, I'm never asking you to leave your mind behind. All right. In 2013, when I shifted my work entirely towards helping women get out of their heads and into their bodies, a lot of women started asking me frustrated, but how and why? I live in my head. Logic is important. And that's a yes end. It is not about abandoning the mind or logic. It's about also exploring the wisdom of your body and your heart. So when you can get that dance down between the body's wisdom and the mind's logic, life gets much better, even if it's already really good. You don't have to be in like a problem or a traumatized or a critical state to benefit from this stuff. This is also a way to rise higher, to take things to another level or to move from one phase of your life and evolve into the next. So tapping into the wisdom of your body helps you build emotional literacy, maturity, intelligence, and resilience. As we mentioned earlier, it helps you to build discernment and trust within yourself, cultivate inner freedom and authority, and embrace your full-fledged power, creativity, essence, and wholeness. So specifically, I want to jump down to what embodiment is in more straightforward terms. So if we break it down, the the word, the E-M comes from the French assimilation E-N, meaning in and into, or also put into or in, bring to a certain state. So we know what body means and meant denotes an action or resulting state. So based on that, when we put it together, M body meant means the state of being in the body. So embodiment work is the practice of being in, present with, and connecting to your body. It's about inhabiting your body fully. Embodiment is a way of being with yourself. It's easily accessible self-care. It's one of the most natural ways of being that most people forget about way, way too often. Something else amazing that I love about embodiment is that it is automatically inclusive. Embodiment is available to anyone, regardless of their body's current size, shape, condition, ability, or wellness or health. Um, Obviously, some things might not be accessible to some folks, but because it's your body, the invitation of embodiment, at least in my world, is always to follow what works for your body, to make any adjustments that are necessary to listen into your body and give your body what it needs. So what's possible through embodiment practice? On the last day of my workshop of 2019, during the very last share, a woman who had been doing embodiment work with me for the last five years said, when I found you, I was totally broken and now I'm whole. So I could list all the things that are possible through embodiment practice, but one word truly encompasses all of it, and that is wholeness. You are a vast and dynamic being with many parts, all of with all of which are worth knowing and integrating. Embodiment practice is the ultimate integration tool. Okay, so the concepts, the four concepts are softening, observing, feeling, and naming. And each concept is an antidote to the challenges of being disconnected from your body. Softening is the antidote to tension, stress, pressure, and anxiety, whether it's rooted in an external cause or just a product of your thinking. Observing is the antidote to lack of knowledge, awareness, and consciousness, particularly related to yourself. And once you get into this, it also unlocks a lot about the world around you. Feeling is the antidote to numbing, avoidance, stuckness, and blocks in your energy and emotions, which can also overlap into your creativity or productivity. And then naming is the antidote to misunderstanding. People in general, and women especially, misunderstand so much about their bodies. So the concepts are the macro aspect of embodiment. They're rooted in larger ideas for you to explore generally, as I will describe a little bit further, and then more thoroughly using the practices um, that are in the embodiment Bible that I will also be walking you through more specifically in the embodiment challenge this week. So Each of these concepts work well on their own, and they also combine for great results. Concepts are the kind of things you sometimes hear people say as if they're easy and no big deal, but you might want to scream like, how? Or what does that even mean? 
And I know this because I've been through these experiences myself. And so I want to, and obviously I've guided many, 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 many women over the years through them. And so as I mentioned earlier, the two that I really want to focus on for this episode here are observing and feeling. So let's get into observing first. When it comes to observing, um, love and truth is a crucial topic in my year-long Power Women's Circle and Wild Some Movement Weekend workshops. And while love is a vast topic that extends beyond individuals, self-love is an important aspect to consider. So in the Wild Soul Movement world, I call it untamed self-love, and there are five elements to it. Self-awareness, self-knowledge, self-acceptance, self-trust, and self-respect. And so you might be wondering, what is the connection between love and observing? Observing requires two things, curiosity and self-awareness. Self-awareness is the foundation for the other four elements of untamed self-love. Being curious about yourself is key to healing and living a more embodied life filled with purpose, joy, wisdom, and truth. So without self-observation and curiosity, you could live your entire life in your blind spots, which inhibits connection, intimacy, opportunities, abundance, trust, love, and more. So observing is not about picking yourself apart. It's about seeing yourself clearly through a compassionate, accepting lens that's also accurate and reliable. It's about creating awareness, calling attention to yourself with purpose. And it's not always easy or pleasant. Sometimes you won't like what you see. But when you commit to observing yourself for the sake of knowing, trusting, accepting, and respecting yourself, you can do it with objectivity rather than scrutiny. So I always teach my clients and students that awareness comes before acceptance and acceptance has to come before improvement. And we talked about that in last week's episode. Otherwise, we're treating ourselves like problems to be fixed, and that is not a loving or respectful way to approach yourself. So this is why feeling becomes important. There's a popular saying, feeling all the feels, that people use as a vague catch-all. In the Wild Soul Movement world, I teach constantly the value of specificity. So let's break down what feeling all the feels actually means. Feeling helps you to connect to three things via your body. Sensations, which are things like hot, cold, pulsating, vibrating, tingling, et cetera. States of being, things like good, bad, calm, agitated, anxious, nervous, tired, energized, hungry, alive, open, etc. And then emotions, things like anger, joy, sadness, fear, excitement, etc. These three things actually make up feeling in its entirety. So sensations, states of being, and emotions. And when you engage with feeling all the feels, Rather than writing it off as one vague experience, you can learn to speak your in-body language, which we've mentioned several times in the episode already, your body's unique language of the senses. Your body is communicating with you all of the time. Once you get proficient at softening and observing, you'll be able to better discern what you're actually feeling and more importantly, glean the wisdom that your feels are loaded with. People avoid paying attention to sensations, states of being, and emotions because they don't want to face themselves. And I get it because it could be daunting. This is why our culture revolves around binging and overindulging on things like Netflix shows, podcasts, tacos, booze, cannabis, brunch, hashtag good vibes, and more. People consume, 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 distract, 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 and in extreme cases, numb, numb, numb. And all of this overconsumption affects digestion, whether it's food, substances, or information. So the desire to avoid or distract from what's really going on in your skin and below the surface is not something to judge yourself about. It's just a result of not having intentionally cultivated the resilience and trust within yourself to know that you can face anything going on and you'll be okay. And it can also be a result of not feeling supported. So not surprisingly, I am here to tell you that embodiment work helps so much with all of this. It might be uncomfortable at first, but the thing is your discomfort sits right next to your potential. Just like your grief and sorrow sit next to your joy, your anger sits next to your acceptance, and your dreams sit next to your fears. So feeling into your sensations, states of being, and emotions is a gift, not something to be afraid of. All right, y'all. I packed a lot into this episode. It it was under an hour, even though it could have been much longer. 
And I literally cannot wait to hear what lands for you, what questions you have. And again, I specifically packed in so many things here that need teasing out and need reflection and exploration because we have the embodiment challenge going on this week to help you do just that, all right? So again, head on over to wildsomemovement.com forward slash embodiment dash challenge if you want to engage in some conversation and specific practices to help you with all this stuff and have that exploration. Um, and again, the embodiment challenge is free. And for those of you who are considering joining me for Power 2020, it's also an incredible taste of what it would be like not only to work with me for the whole year next year, but what it would feel like to be in the community that I cultivate and curate as well. So thank you so, so much for listening. Share this up. Links to anything I mentioned will be in the show notes at untameyourself.com forward slash 328. And that's a wrap. I will see you next week. Acceptance is not approval, endorsement, sanction, or support. Acceptance is simply a gateway to healing and better solutions. And I think that's really important to emphasize because why a lot of people resist accepting is because they think, well, if I accept this thing, that means I'm okay with it. It doesn't have to mean that. So because the theme of this journey into the wild soul is wholeness, and one of the key experiences to your wholeness is acceptance, I want to be honest, getting to acceptance can be a hard gateway to come by. 